welcome to part two of how we got into Oxford. I am Tria and I studied medicine at Oxford. I'm Aria and I'm going to start English at Oxford this year. And in part one of the video, we talked about our GCSEs, our A-levels, why we chose our subjects and why we chose Oxford in particular. Today, we're going to be talking about our university choices, the entrance exams, interviews, and give you some tips. Let's get into the video. Let's start by talking about our university choices. So I'll start. For medicine in the UK, you can apply to the maximum of four medical schools and then you can apply to one other school for something else. So I applied to Oxford. Then I also applied to Imperial College London, Queen Mary's University of London and King's College London. And as you can see, these were all in London, apart from Oxford. And that was a big thing for me because I really loved London as a city. So aside from Oxford, and I talked about the reasons why I wanted to apply to Oxford in the first video, but aside from that, I thought I really wanted to be in London. So this is why I chose all the other universities as London universities. And then for my fifth choice, I decided that my backup was going to be natural sciences. So uh, for my fifth subject, I applied to natural sciences at UCL. So what about you? So for me, I applied to Oxford, UCL, King's, Queen Mary's and Warwick. So... Oh, I forgot you applied to Warwick. Yeah, I did. Oh, I thought you applied to Bristol. I wanted to apply to Bristol. <laughs> okay. And anyway. then I ended up going for Warwick. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to go to Oxford. But apart from that, I just really wanted to be no more than like an hour and a half drive away from home. Because I just thought I want to visit a lot. And if I get sick or something, I want it to be really easy to come home. So that's kind of why I chose mainly London unis and yeah. Mm -hmm. So another reason why I applied to those specific universities was for their entrance requirements. I wanted to apply to a mixture of different universities. So ones that accepted the BMAT and the UCAT, which was known as the UK CAT back in the day. So for me, Oxford and Imperial accepted the BMAT and Queen Mary's and King's accepted the UK CAT. And also, I wanted to apply to universities that had a variation of grade requirements. The Oxford requirement was A star AA, and Imperial was also A star AA, but my other two universities, uh, King's and Queen Mary's, were triple A. It's good to have a range, I think. So for me, I basically looked at the league tables for English, and I basically applied to all the top universities that were quite close to my house. And also, a lot of people say that you should choose an English course based on the content. But for me, I've found that I kind of enjoy everything and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I thought that I wouldn't take that too much into consideration. So why did you choose Oxford over Cambridge? So other than, you know, people in our household not being allowed to talk about the other place, mm -hmm. um, I didn't apply there because of the grade requirement, which was A star AA. Getting good grades in English exams and in history exams has always been really difficult because it's so unreliable. So I just didn't want to put pressure on myself to necessarily get an A star and A level. So because Oxford's just three A's, I thought that was really good. Mm. And obviously, you know, Oxford's better than everything. <laughs> So let's now talk about the university entrance exams. So I briefly touched on this before. For medicine from almost every single university, you have to do an entrance exam. And this is the BMAT or the UCAT. Um, and they're slightly different exams. BMAT is more traditional. It has um, elements that are related to biology, chemistry, physics, and maths, and also essay writing. And then the UCAT test skills that are not necessarily ones that you study at school. So these are things like verbal reasoning, non-verbal reasoning, spatial reasoning, situational judgment. It's a bit of a different exam and the way that you prepare for them are quite different as well. What about English? So for English for Oxford and the Cambridge exam is quite similar. You have to do the ELAT, which is the English Literature Admissions Test. This is like a 90 minute test where you have a choice of six literary texts and you have to write an essay comparing two of them. And did you have to do any entrance exams for any other university? Uh, no, I didn't, yeah. How did you prepare the ELAT and when did you start revising? Um, I started revising in the half term in October. Of your year 13? Of year 13 because the test was in November and I had a couple of weeks then to revise. Mm -hmm. and. The first thing I did was I went on YouTube and I watched all the videos to do with the ELAP mm -hmm. and that was really helpful because 
a lot of Oxford colleges published like paper walkthroughs and tips from students mm. and that was helpful and also in it a lot of people recommended books where you can learn about more literary devices and things that you can include in your essay. I read some of those books and then after that I just did a past paper every morning for a couple of weeks and then every afternoon I would read some of the books, write down new literary devices or they have um, some model answers on the website so I just highlight them and try and copy the structure mm. and it was difficult because their mark scheme isn't very clear and I didn't know if I was doing it right but what did help was I got my English teachers, my school librarian to read over my answers and give me advice so that did help a bit, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So you really worked quite hard. But interestingly, that was the most enjoyable part of the process for me because it was just analysing random wacky stories from around the world, which is why I actually wanted to do the degree. So it did also help me realise that this is the right one for me. Yeah, that's really nice, actually. So for me, for the UCAT and the BMAT, when I was studying, you could do the UCAT whenever you wanted, and it had to be before you submitted your application. And then the BMAT, you had to sit on a specific date, which would be after your application um, had gone in. So the benefits of that is that you have your UCAT score in front of you when you're applying, so you can use that to consider what medical schools you want to apply to, because a lot of medical schools will publish their um, average UCAT scores of their successful candidates. Whereas the BMAT, because you don't have your score, you're doing it after you've applied, you have to take a leap of faith when it comes to um, applying to those specific medical schools. So for UCAT, what I did was I took the exam as early as possible, so I think this was really good because that meant that I had a lot more time to work on the other aspects of my application and also my A-levels. So I took my UCAT in the summer between year 12 and year 13 and I think I took it in around early August. In that way I had it out of the way before year 13 even started. UCAT is a very unique exam in that it's very difficult to revise for in traditional ways. So the one thing I would recommend, and this is the only thing I did, is just practice papers online. They publish past papers. I would definitely do those, just keep practicing those questions. And then uh, there are certain books and there are also online question banks that have questions that are in the similar format to UCAT. So I would just do those. And then for the BMAT, obviously, because it's slightly different, um, past papers in that sense are really useful as well. But there are other aspects of the exams which you can work on in a more traditional revision sense. So for example, they say that the BMAT science section is at the equivalent level of GCSE biology, chemistry, physics and maths. So if you haven't done one of those subjects in A-level, it's useful then to revise those and just to have a refresher. And then for the essay section, um, some of those essays are based on medical ethics and some are based on philosophy. So the way I would do that is I would just practice writing some random essays that usually based on the question papers from the past. And then I would uh, try to keep up with like medical ethics, current affairs in medicine, because that would just help me to shape my arguments. When I did my practice papers at home and I wrote these essays, uh, kindly, one of our philosophy teachers um, offered to give us feedback on our essays. So it was really useful in that way because I hadn't obviously studied a humanity in A-level. So I was a little bit out of practice when it came to writing essays. So it was really good to get the opinion of a philosophy teacher on my writing. This actually ended up being quite useful for Oxford because in Oxford, medicine is considered a mixture between art and science. So although you do practicals in labs and you do dissections and things like that, you mainly write essays and that's the way that you learn. So it was actually quite good to um, have done some essay writing practice. So do you have any tips in terms of revising for the ELAT? I would say that a good tip for me is that it might seem like something really wacky and different to what you do in your English essays and I was quite worried that I had to write this amazingly creative, strange argument, but actually in the real exam, I wrote a pretty straightforward argument based on a theme that I thought was quite obvious in the text and just analyzing the text to support that. So I would say, just don't worry about it being wacky or original, just do what you do in your normal English essays. So Aria, why do you want to study English at Oxford? So, <laughs> now we're going to talk about interviews. 
For Oxford, I had four interviews, <laughs> um, two at one college and two at the other. This is the way it worked for Oxford. So you applied to one specific college and then you got randomly allocated a second college to get more interviews. So this is like a pooling system, but they do it beforehand. Whereas in some universities, such as Cambridge, they will invite you back for a second interview if they want you, but the college that you applied to doesn't have space. And so I did four interviews for Oxford, and then I also had interviews for all of my other medical schools because almost every single medical school requires an interview. So how many interviews did you have to do? So I only interviewed for Oxford and I did two interviews. So two interviews at the same college? Uh, yeah, they were both at the same college. And the style of interviews, so Oxford was obviously traditional panel interview, and then the same was for Imperial. And then at King's and Queen Mary's, I had multiple mini interviews, so MMI stations. I think they're called something else now, but um, what about you? So both of mine were in the traditional style. I just had two interviewers and it was me, and yeah. Interestingly, obviously, because I did it back in the day when we didn't have the pandemic, so I stayed over in Oxford. So I had two interviews on a Sunday night, and then I stayed over in one of the colleges, and then I had two interviews in person in another college. But yours were online, so you did them in your bedroom in your pyjamas, pretty much. <laughs> I wasn't wearing my pyjamas, but I will admit that I was wearing my fluffy bear socks underneath my sensible outfit. Yeah. So, um, how did you prepare for your interviews? For me, like, one of the ways I prepared was by doing mock interviews um, with my neighbour, with some, my English teachers and with some alumni from my school. I also prepared the knowledge by just going through all the books that I knew I was going to talk about and making sure that I had like two interesting opinions on each, just in case I was asked about them. I also wanted to prepare for the general questions like why is English important to the world and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So what helped me a lot with that was a tip that I actually got from you, which was to listen to TED Talks and make notes on the ones I heard. So I just typed in literature and I listened to all of the TED Talks that came up on YouTube. And what was really handy is that other people's arguments, I was just able to use them as long as I agreed with them and could defend them. I could use their arguments and that gave me a lot of inspiration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for me, I had to slightly tailor my interview preparation to the different schools. So Oxford, I knew would be slightly rogue interview, where it would be more focused on academics, whereas the other interviews would be more traditional medicine interviews. But for the Oxford interview, I knew that I would then be pushed academically. For Oxford, it's, you know, the interview style is in the style of doing a tutorial, which is one of the main ways that you learn in Oxford. So essentially a, a tutorial is where you sit down with a professor and you have a session where you talk about a specific subject and they push you and it's a good way of learning and stretching yourself academically. So in, in some ways, the Oxford interview is similar to a tutorial and the professors or the interviewers are seeing whether they would enjoy teaching you and whether you demonstrate potential to respond well to that type of environment. You can't really revise academics for the Oxford interview because you'd probably be pushed outside of your A-level or whatever curriculum that you are studying. The, one of the really key things in Oxford interviews is being able to talk about how you think and to be able to demonstrate your thinking out loud and be able to sort of respond then to what people are saying. So the way, so that sounds quite difficult to practice, but the way to do it is to talk about things that you're unfamiliar with and being able to explain yourself and articulate your own reasoning. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do agree. I would start off with the kind of obvious ones, like what is literature, what is a poem, what is a story, and that kind of thing. And then I would focus a lot on your own interests. Say if you read a book, what about the way the writer wrote it? Do you think made it effective? Do you think it, you can compare it with anything else that you've read? Maybe, is there anything you disagreed with or did it change your mind about anything? One thing my supervisor told me at school was put more of myself into it. So rather than just saying, oh, this book is about the class system, I would say like, I personally was really moved by the way that they showed the poverty of this character because it made me realize that like in Victorian times, the society was really unequal. So it was a bit more like personal. And I remember when you were thinking about applying, you were thinking a lot about what your specific interests were. Do you want to talk about which topics you focused on? Yeah, so what really helped me with this was doing the EPQ as well as entering an essay competition. 
um, I decided to make my focus kind of post-colonialism and the way that race and prejudice and stuff are depicted in text because I love controversial things and that always called to me. I did this thing where I compared canonical texts from England with their post-colonial rewritings. For instance, Jane Eyre has a counterpart called Wide Sargasso Sea where the author focuses on the Caribbean woman who's the mad woman in the attic and the kind of idea about how that relates to England and its relationship with the colonies. So in having this kind of specific focus, I think it shows that I like have an individual interest in literature that isn't just my A-levels. Mm. But what I will say is that this was really helpful for my personal statement, but not so much for my interview because the first thing that he said to me was, he put my personal statement to the side and he was like, so what else do you like to read? And I was really floored because like I had worked on this one thing for mm. so long. And in the end, I ended up talking about a book that you recommended for me to read for fun, which was Clockwork Orange and Animal Farm, which was my GCSE text. So I actually ended up talking about books that I had just read for pleasure and for other reasons. So I would say like, don't freak out if you end up not talking about the things you prepared because if you like the subject then they'll know it and you can talk about anything and you know that will come through. For my other interviews rather than picking on anything in particular in my personal statement they looked at my academic transcript and saw that I studied physics and were quite interested in that so for one interview I had to talk about um, the eye and how light refracts and I ended up having to draw a couple of diagrams and then I, from my other interview I remember when I was ready to go for my interview the student before me he was coming out he just looked at me and he said Rubik's Cube <laughs> which is really <laughs> and I was thinking oh my god like I don't know anything about maths I was really worried about <laughs> having to then work out having to then talk about the like number of combinations and things like that and I was like statistics were going around in my head I, and I saw the Rubik's Cube there and I was really picking out but I think Thankfully, I wasn't asked about the Rubik's Cube. I think they were maybe doing the Rubik's Cube every other candidate. So I was really lucky in that sense that I didn't get asked about that. But I was then presented with a map. It was nothing to do with medicine, but it was a map of Europe. And there were bomb sites in World War II. And I had to then draw a graph. So it was like a very random topic, but it was you having to apply like basic principles of maths and statistics in order to work out wacky things. It is a stereotype that in Oxford interviews are very crazy and like they'll just throw you a ball or they'll just be silent. <laughs> and although it's not exactly like that, there are elements that are a bit wacky. Always the way to approach these types of questions is start from basic principles, be logical and to think out loud and to be responsive to what they're saying. I completely agree with that, especially the starting with the basics, thinking out loud. Like for me, um, my first interview was the one which all English students get, which is where they give you two poems and they give you five minutes to read them and then they just ask you to talk about the poem. And it was quite difficult because the poems were like those really obscure, strange, kind of surreal type ones where you don't even know what's going on. But what helped me when they said like, oh, what do you think of the poem? I just started by saying the absolute basic, like it's about a guy walking down a road. And then I would say, okay, but in the road, I can see these elements and these words are repeated. And then I, in my mind, as I was saying that, I was thinking, what do those words make me think of? And I was thinking, oh, they're all related to this one theme. And mm -hmm. like with each sentence, I get closer and closer to making an actual point. But I obviously didn't start out knowing what point that was going to be. Mm -hmm. If I could say one more thing about my interview experience, it was that I heard a lot of things about what the interview was going to be like. For instance, I heard people saying that they had a really interesting back and forth with their interviewers and that they learned new things and that they actually started to enjoy themselves. And I didn't have any of that. Like I didn't enjoy so that, myself. That was my experience. That was your experience. Yeah, yeah. I think I heard that from you as well. Mm. It's like, I really found it stressful. I didn't think I learned anything. And it was very much like question, answer, question, answer. I didn't feel like we were having a conversation. Mm. And so I really stressed out and I thought that they found it really boring and that I'd done really badly. But I would say like, when you're that nervous, it's okay if it's not enjoyable or if you feel like you're not learning because to be honest you're not going to enjoy anything when you're that nervous it is really true what people say that you can't tell how it went 
yeah. definitely definitely i had one question that we ended with where they asked me if i'd read any medieval literature and it, which like could show that i was interested in the oxford course in particular and i was just like no i was like oh but i guess it's similar to other literature in that it deals with the same issues like gender and power and stuff and I thought that I like messed up the whole interview because I hadn't gotten the perfect answer on that one question. Mm. But I think like it's not any one question, so it's okay if you feel like you gave a bad answer to one because mm. it's the whole picture. Yeah. Yeah. Like I remember in one of my interviews in Oxford, they asked me about my work experience, um, and I talked about you know some of the things I'd learned, but I didn't really focus on diseases. I kind of talked more about like the pastoral side. But then she asked me, but what diseases did you see? And I really had a mind blank and I just couldn't remember anything that I had seen and I think I said something about the liver but I just remember thinking oh gosh like this is not good but actually you know it was fine in the end. Now we're going to talk about our A-level grades and our university offers. So I was interviewed at Oxford, King's, Queen Mary's and Imperial and I got offers from Oxford, um, Queen Mary's and Imperial and then I was put on the waiting list for King's. So I got offers from Oxford, UCL, King's, Queen Mary's and Warwick, but I only had to do an interview for Oxford. And in terms of grades, so for me, I put Oxford as my first choice and then I put Queen Mary's as my backup choice because although I really wanted to go to Imperial, the grade requirement was the same for Oxford and Imperial, so it wasn't a very logical backup. So that's why I put Oxford as number one and Queen Mary's as number two. Um, for me, it was kind of similar. I really wanted to hold on to like Kings, but they were all AAA. So I had to choose Oxford as my main and Queen Mary's, which was ABB, as my insurance. We had the same universities. We had the same universities. We went to the same school, very similar GCSEs, same grades, and then the same university, but obviously different colleges. So in terms of grades, so I got an A star in biology, and then A's in maths, physics, and chemistry, and then an A in my EPQ. And this was exactly my offer for Oxford, so I was really happy, and I got in. I got an A star in French and A's in English, History, Maths and I got an A in EPQ and I needed three A's so I also got that. So, yeah. Now, uh, should we talk a little bit about our reflections and any regrets and advice that we have? When I look back, I think what I would tell myself at the beginning is that it helps if you kind of break it up into each section. You work really hard just before you have to do your personal statement and right before your interview and right before you know your A levels but in the time in between you know take a break focus on other things take care of yourself because in those in between points I felt like there wasn't really anything I could have done and yet I felt like every single day I had to think about Oxford and do something Oxford related which probably just caused me more heartache and didn't really help. And then for me I would say that if you're thinking about Oxford and you're not sure I think it's better to just apply rather than thinking, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm not going to apply because I think I won't get in. You know, for everyone, regardless of who you are, it's very slim chance of getting into Oxford anyway, just because of how competitive it is. So I'd say just go for it. If you don't get in, you don't get in, that's fine, but you can say that you've tried. Yeah, sometimes, you know, it's almost like a lottery where I know a lot of people who are so much smarter than me and worked really hard and just didn't make it. And that applies to anyone, so you may as well just Go give it a it. shot and if it doesn't work then it's probably just because of chance and because it's so like there's so few spaces okay so i hope that you found that useful and i hope that you got some insight into applying to oxford and what it was like okay thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one bye bye